if you had to give dancers three tips to improving it, and it might not be in relation to competition, but if you had to give dancers three tips to improve their dancing in general, what would you what would you tell them? Ooh, just three. Ooh, that is hard. That is just hard. Okay. Three. Uh, just three to improve their dancing. Um, let the first one. I'll be yeah. Let go of any like negativity in your head like you have to just want to have fun all the time that uh, it doesn't matter if you want to compete or perform or just social dance you actually just want to have fun and, and mentally just let go that is I think the mm-hmm. best that you're I think for everyone the best ever social dances the best performances the best ever classes are when you actually have let go mentally and you just enjoy and you let the music take your like you, you just engulf the music, engulf the connection with, with your partner or with the people or with the energy and you literally just have fun and you don't remember what you do what you did. You don't remember mm. like you just remember the feeling of it being good. So mentally mm-hmm. letting go. Because I think that will allow people to just improve in whatever way they want to improve. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, then I would say my, my teacher side says <laughs> work on your timing always work on your timing and mm-hmm. and that just doesn't mean basic timing it actually means like understand how you can like uh, we learn things that are very structured and they're they very they seem very like boxed in like this is the one this is the two this is how you do things very boxed in and then the more comfortable you get is when you can play around with those rules and play around with timing so i guess mm-hmm. Timing to me is something that you can always work on. You can play around with mm-hmm. how to elongate certain things without being off time. If that makes sense. So timing, mm-hmm. mentally letting go. And then the third one. The third one. Um, drop your heels. There you go. <laughs> drop your heels. There is no reason you need to be on your tippy toes holding for dear life. Drop your heels. There's a time and place to be on your ball to foot. To drop the foot. There you go. Those are my three. Okay, they're good. They're good <laughs> tips. So, in relation to the timing one, how can dancers improve their time? What can they work on in order to elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, once you once you've gone past your basic timing and understanding it, um, then you play around with understanding the different instruments that make up salsa and how they have their own timing. They have their own rhythm. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is the beauty of salsa, but also at first it, it can be really confusing because salsa music can have how many instruments being played at the same time. And the hard part is not every salsa song sounds the same, right? Not mm-hmm. every salsa song will have the same instruments, will have the same emphasis. Um, so learning the different timings of clave, learning the different timings, learning the tumbao, learning what all those different aspects um, of music is really important. Then also understanding how music builds up and drops. Mm-hmm. Um, and so people know this, people recognize it. So like you take music like, um, I don't know, pop music, EDM music, very mainstream music. We hear it, we can recognize all oh, the drops coming and boom, right? We, we hear yep, that. Yep. Salsa music can be very confused. It can be as simple as that, but also can be a little bit more complex. So the more you listen to music, the more you dance to music, the more you social dance, the more you the, uh, do salsa dancing to different salsa music will help you understand how you can mm. change the timing and emphasize differently. Mm-hmm. Did you have any mentors or teachers uh, in the past that have helped you understand that? Help me with timing. John Narvaez was really very good at understanding. He was the first one person that was like, we would have lessons. Is this? And you'd be like, is this song two, three clever or three, two clever? And I remember the first time I was like, what? But I also grew up playing music. So I, I also loved that part of salsa, salsa dancing. It was, it, I found it, um, it wasn't hard for me to understand and learn those things. So I played classical piano for 12 years. Um, mm-hmm. So John was one of them. Uh, Tito from Tito and Tamara, Tito uh, from Puerto Rico, has helped yep. me a lot with 
different inch growth with different uh, understanding different timing. And yeah, that was uh, I would say those would be the main two. I've worked with a lot of people that have that have helped me with timing or helped me with understanding music. Um, so I guess they mean everyone, but those are the two that stand out the most. Mm. That I would so what do you do? Like COVID's maybe not such a good example because it's sort of like a forced isolation. But if you're ever feeling like you you just want to dance, like like how do you go about that? Do you go social dancing? Do you freestyle like in your house, or do you go to a studio and put music on and then like jam out? Like what do you do if you're really craving movement? Yeah, if I'm really craving movement, I have I think I have two 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 sides in my like I would say I have two things in my body that oh uh, sorry I'm just um I have two two aspects in my life I think I told everyone I was doing this interview but it's a bit low we but, booked this space um, I <laughs> I know excuse me the door is closed <laughs> okay. um the, no look there's seven there's six other people that live in this household so it's, it's a lot but it's okay um, but going back to the question, I have two sides to me. I have, I love being a student. So for as much as I love teaching, I love being a student because I love shutting off that side of my brain that has to think of what to create. And I just want to like mm. be a sponge. That's, I've always, I just love learning. So I, if I'm feeling like I want to dance and learn and I'm like, I'm really like, I'm just, I need to be a student again. I'll go take classes. And there's just, depending on what I want, like there's, Melbourne is really awesome that we have such a wide range of people in teacher classes of all sorts of styles mm-hmm. throughout, throughout the day, right before COVID. Um, mm-hmm. So I'll have that side, I'll go to a class. And if I just want to like, literally, I'm like, nah, I just want to dance by myself, I'll put music, I'll dance in the house. Um, mm-hmm. If I'm really keen, I'll book a studio and do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I usually tend to just, yeah, dance dance in the house um I used to dance in the gym in between sets like mm-hmm. I was that person up there yeah you do that too um, I do that yeah. I dance in between sets yeah I I used to when I was really competing I used to I remember I used to find different ways to uh, or different instances to listen to the song that I'm competing to so I would do it I was notorious to do it in my car so I would do it when I'm forced not to transfer weight like you have, I, mm-hmm. I know this sounds like you're distracting, so maybe I shouldn't use the car example. Anyway, but I would use it to then work on the routine mentally and still be able to do something else physically. That's, That's an interesting way of looking at it because, and obviously because you've got a like a huge history of competing and and so much success competing. Do you have any advice for people that want to compete or people that want to take their comp- their competitiveness to the next level? What would you advise them? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess there's so many steps towards the how to get ready to compete. At the end of the day, you have to build confidence. The biggest thing that we like to see in, on stage or in social, everything, that whatever type of performing you're doing is about confidence, right? So you have mm-hmm. to build yourself confidence outside of the getting, learning the routine, remembering the choreography, feeling comfortable, performing many times before your big performance, yada, yada, there's like the laundry list. But at, right at the end, I guess, when you mentally let go, going back to that thing I said about letting go, you don't, you act, there's a moment where you, your body takes over. You have this mm-hmm. like, your your memory, your muscle memory of, of, of your routine, you could do it on in your sleep. And the only uh, mm-hmm. a good way to, to go through that is to not just repeat the dance or continue to perform all the time, but it's also to listen to the, to the music and not move and just mentally imagine the performance. Imagine what you're going to do. This is when I go up. This is when I look this way. This is when I, I feel this emotion. This is when I want to like hit it hard. This is when I breathe. This is when I like, um, mm. I grunt or this is when, and you mentally do that without physically moving your body. Because if you do that during your performance, you actually will mentally let go and your body and your emotions will come out. And that's when we as an audience really feel what you're feeling because you're not thinking mm. anymore. And we've seen people 
be in their heads and be like, oh, you know, you, you were in your head, you were thinking, you didn't seem as confident. So once you let that go, there is, I would say at the end, listen to your song, over, get, get used to everything in that music and remember it mentally mm-hmm. outside of the suit. Mm. What do you think uh, like the future of competing will look like? like? I know we've seen a lot of changes uh, to like rules and there's been different divisions popping up. And, and so I remember when bachata just used to be bachata and now they have plastic and now they have cabaret and now they have sensual. Do you, do you think there'll be many changes to competition in the future? Uh, outside of COVID scenario? Uh, yeah, outside know. of COVID. Outside of COVID, I don't really, I, I guess I, the reason I say I don't know is I am a firm believer to evolution of any art form. And so mm-hmm. the beauty of me being in, in the ballroom world is I have seen, and if you go back to seeing, like if you go back to seeing how ballroom dancers used to look in the 30s, like you would laugh, you would chuckle, you'd be like, that is not what it looks like now. But there was an evolution that naturally happened throughout the years. And so the dancing, like ballroom dancing has gone through so much change and so many influences mm-hmm. that have changed the art form. And I think the beauty of ballroom is that Yes, there was always struggle to change, but at the end of the day, the majority of the ballroom world accepted change and evolution and went with it. And that's how that, that is how it's been so strong and, and has gone for so long. So I guess for me mentally, I don't, I haven't restricted my mind to thinking salsa competition and salsa dancing needs to stay the way it is now. Um, mm-hmm. You can always go back to your roots and you can always understand the fundamentals and know the history and know where things come from. But I guess I mentally, I, I, I enjoy knowing that I mentally allow for things to evolution and change how it's meant to be. So that, mm. that, is, that is life. That is things are always going to change and evolution will happen naturally. And stopping mm. it or mentally stopping it, I don't think is healthy. Good. I was like, and I would tell people, I would tell people, like, I, the only way I'd be competing is if I come down from a crystal ball, come down like J-Lo in probably Las Vegas, open the crystal ball, <laughs> not to mention the crystal ball is like stones. I do one basic, a Suzy Q, sit back in the crystal ball and shimmy my way up. And that would be a minute and a half of my routine. That's what I'm going to do.